Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, stopping in. Um, so I thought a lot about uh, you know, what to put into these slides uh, and, and what would be really the right address to make for the MIT Bitcoin Expo. And I decided that the right thing to talk about was just why. You know, why are we here? You know, it's a Saturday. You could be doing a lot of other things. What do we care about? What's exciting to us? And you know, what, what's really the purpose of, of, of being here at all? So first, who am I? Uh, so this is me back in uh, 2014 at the first MIT Bitcoin Expo. That's my friend, Dan Elitzer, who helped me put it together. Uh, so I've been doing this stuff for, for a while. Um, and I've you know, found myself pretty committed to working on this. Um, so you know, I've worked on it before. Uh, before 2014 uh, as well, and, and why, why have I stuck in? Um, today, uh, I'm, and I'll just tell you a little bit about what I'm doing you know, now. Um, I am building a company called uh, Judica.org. I also like making fun art for it, so I do a lot of uh, you know, fun little animations and stuff. What am I doing there? Well, it's, uh, as I said earlier in the panel, I'm trying to make Bitcoin the platform for capitalism. Um, I'm building a Bitcoin programming language called Sapio. Um, and one of the focuses that we have in terms of product is to uh, help you make DAOs on Bitcoin. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why I think that's important later. But for now, if you, you, know, you can try and scan that. Uh, I don't know if that'll work, but um, trying to get people who want to build DAOs. And we'll talk about why I think that's important um, as a concept, but that is what I'm doing. Um, probably one of few people who likes both Bitcoin a lot and also likes DAOs. Um, although maybe there's some people who secretly would not admit to being in DAOs, but also being a Bitcoin maxi. So let's get into it, why? So here we've got a nice picture of me in uh, 2011 with uh, Ron Paul. Uh, and then I've got a picture of me in 2021 with uh, Ron Paul. And that was sort of, uh, you know, that was kind of fun because I had my, you know, decade of being a, a Ron Paul fan going from sort of around the time when I first heard about Bitcoin, which was actually in uh, Andy over there. It was in his lab. I was slacking off, reading on the internet on Hacker News while I should have been working on my internship. And I read about Bitcoin. I don't know if I ever told you that was, uh, that was the backstory. Um, and from there, I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, and then I mined a little bit on my laptop, um, but I was like, eh, the, the fan is turning on. So, you know, making a quarter of a Bitcoin, not even a whole Bitcoin, like I'm going to shut this off. Um, so big regrets there. Um, but why was Bitcoin so cool to me? You know, I'm this Ron Paul fan, and the, the answer is about liberty. Um, and so the thought process for, for me at the time was a little bit like this. I like liberty. Uh, the, the Fed is sort of this unaccountable thing. And unaccountable rules means that we're dealing with a manipulated economy. Um, inflation is kind of you know, theft. It's anti-self-sovereign. The money's being stolen out from under you, and you can't do anything about it. And it's also just like inefficient. Like Even if you wanted to reallocate resources, uh, doing it through a system that like, picks winners without any sort of control over, over why or insight into why those decisions are made was, was, to me, pretty bad. And so what I believed at that time was that I was like, audit the Fed, like right on. Uh, this is really cool. Um, that was never going to happen, but it was cool to be a part of it and to be at the Ron Paul rallies and be like, yeah, let's audit the Fed. And, you know, I don't know. Like, of course, it's not going to you know, actually happen, but it's good to be that thorn in the side of the system. But then Satoshi went and invented Bitcoin, and that was kind of like a whoa you know, moment for me because Bitcoin has this auditable issuance. And for me, it was like, all right, this system is going to win. Um, and I think what's interesting there is, is today we have a culture that is, is really, really fixated on this notion of sound money. And, oh, we're going to be NGU, you know, there's the finite supply. And actually, I can't speak for anyone else, but I can speak for myself in saying that I really did not at that time care about this notion of finite supply. I just cared about auditable supply. I felt, hey, you know, maybe as a society we could agree to some arbitrary issuance some sort of control of where things are going out. But what I cared was that the rules weren't being changed once I started playing the game by somebody who's playing the game against me, which is sort of what I felt the Fed was representing. I didn't feel that that was a fair system. And that's something to think about when you, you know, look at any of these monetary protocols is, well, who's in control? Is it 
do you care about the auditability or do you care about the fixed nature? Would Bitcoin be good if it was fixed, but Satoshi minted all the coins to himself from the get-go? Like that would probably not be a system that you would want to use. So what is liberty? I've said that this is like really the important thing and the thing that's kept me, you know, as this North Star of like, I'm going to work towards liberty. And liberty, ultimately, it's, it's your right to decide what makes you happy and to do what makes you happy. And if you can do you know, both of those things, both have the freedom to decide what makes you happy and do what you've decided makes you happy, then you actually have uh, a pretty good amount of liberty, I would say. Uh, and I'm happy to you know, debate that definition if people define it some other way, but sort of this pursuit of happiness notion. Um, and so why, why care at all about this? Well, it turns out if you're sitting in this room, you're kind of like already the wealthiest people in the world, both in terms of money and liberty. Like you could do anything this Saturday afternoon and then you chose to go to an entire event dedicated to like making money. Like, you know, wow, you, you can just kind of pick whatever you want. You could have been out, you know, getting uh, some of those like nut and fruit boxes at Tate, you know, like around the corner. Like that's what I would be doing if I weren't here. But instead we're here and we're like, oh, we're gonna do this because we're excited and we get to do whatever we're excited about. We're at MIT where we have access to the experts in any given field. And from this point in our, you know, not everybody's a student, but from this point in our lives, like there's anything that we could do, anything we could achieve, anything we can dream about, we have the ability to do that from this point, right? And, and there's sort of sky's the limit, nothing can hold you back. But this is why I'm giving this talk is like, what I wanna encourage you is like, well, there's a lot of people in the world who, who don't, have that and are not, uh, you know, this close to the to the uh, uh, nexus of optionality where you can you can really get whatever liberty you want. And I think that you can maximize your impact by using your opportunity to help other people be able to actualize and experience liberty. So, if you say to me like, well, you know, what makes me happy is like making money, then maybe work on Wall Street or you know today like just add Web3 DeFi L2 to your pitch deck. And like you will have as much money as you want. Something that I see is like, you know, like, oh, Jeremy, why are you doing this Bitcoin startup? You realize that you could literally take this pitch deck and then you could go, you know, and like, well, it's not about just making money. You know, I have the opportunities that I have. Um, if you like making art, you know, like, okay, pick up a paintbrush, you know, maybe use it for some political speech or something. That could be cool. If you just like solving interesting tech problems, well, like, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, like they, we do have, you know, interesting tech problems to work on, but they're not necessarily even the most interesting ones of all time. It's like they're, I don't know, they're like moderate. There's a lot of other interesting things to do. So maybe just do a PhD in computer science or, you know, something like that and find really, really challenging, hard problems that nobody's even thought about before. That might be even more fulfilling for you. But if, you're fo if you want to focus on like helping people, and that's sort of where you're like, I, I want people to be helped in, in, in some way, um, I think it's a little bit of a humble perspective to say, I actually don't know how to help people because I might think that everybody would be really helped if I um, gave them a high five. And then you're gonna go around, you're gonna be like, let me high five all of you. And, and somebody might just be like, dude, I just do not want a high five. Like, and that's fine, okay. So if that's not what people want, you deciding this is how you're gonna help somebody doesn't necessarily help them. And so if you take a step back from that, the meta is, well, I'm going to help people be able to, one, decide what makes them happy and be able to even ask themselves that question because a lot of people are too caught in the grind to even be able to say, well, what is it that makes me happy? And then to actually be able to do that. And obviously there's some conflict resolution where if what makes them happy is you know, slapping you in the face, like as we've you know, seen is now maybe like socially normal, uh, like that's probably not good for everyone. It's, it's kind of non-aggression principle violating somebody else's happiness. But as long as what somebody wants to do is sort of in their own domain and makes them happy, like helping people do that and find ways of doing that is a really good thing. So at its core, Bitcoin is liberty technology. And it is something that is designed to be able to give people the ability to decide for themselves what makes them happy and do it without the interference of, of others. And that's sort of important. The way that Bitcoin uh, sort of would need your help to fulfill that vision is to work on privacy, self-sovereignty, decentralization, and scaling. Um, those are sort of four fundamental categories for Bitcoin. Um, and uh, they're sort of things where 
if Bitcoin does not have those uh, as sort of inherent elements, it will probably not serve very well to actually bring people liberty. We'll talk about each one of those independently. So privacy is keeping your business your business. Um, one of the reasons why this is key to liberty is that anytime people know that you're, that you're doing something, uh, people are nosy and they want to say something about it. I just talked to you know, one of my neighbors and uh, you know, she put out a little tree house for her kids uh, in, in front of her house and somebody in her HOA complained and she said, you, you look, it's just a tree house in the front yard there's literally around the corner, and, and you know, I'm belaying the story, but like a, a heroin house where they're dealing drugs out of the house, and you're worried about me having something on my lawn for my kids to play in? Like, where are your priorities? It's like, oh, well, like what they do in their house is their business. But anytime somebody can see what you're doing, they're going to complain about it, you know, and they're going to say, oh, well, we don't like this. And there's also sort of a little bit of a feedback loop where when you're aware that people are observing what you're doing, you may not actually be able to do what it is you actually want to do. And there are societies where people you know, are repressed for their ideas or religious beliefs or medical decisions. And so that's where privacy, keeping your business your business, is really, really critical. So for Bitcoin, uh, privacy is something that is sort of deeply in jeopardy. Uh, it sucks, and we don't really have a great set of tools to systemically improve it that are available today. There are some other cryptocurrencies that have uh, you know, made big advances in that, but they all have a set of trade-offs that have not yet been something we can directly realize into Bitcoin. Um, and so there are a lot of things you could work on if this is something that sort of appeals to you. You could work on Lightning, you could work on payment pools, CoinJoin, swaps, you know, new cryptography, or you know, really anything you set your mind to. But privacy is one of these fundamental things for if you want to help people be able to do what it is that they would like to be able to do. Privacy helps them do it without the censorship of others. So relatedly, there's self-sovereignty. And these two can kind of look similar um, uh, in some senses, but they are distinct concepts. And self-sovereignty is the idea that you don't have to trust anyone, and everything you have is auditable to you, and you're the one in control. Now, as opposed to privacy, privacy might be that you don't want to do the thing because you're going to be embarrassed, but self-sovereignty is that you could still do it anyways, that nobody can actually stop you from doing these things. So if you want to you know, make a payment to your family member uh, in another country, that you're able to make that directly to them and there's nobody who can take the money away from them. That if you want to uh, you know, pay for you know, medical services that have become recently illegal, that you can make that payment and nobody can stop the payment. Um, so that's sort of the self-sovereignty angle. Also, if you, uh, you know, are holding money, that nobody can just come and say, oh, well, you have less money now, or we've taken it away. So that uh, auditability of the supply is really important, but also the uh, self-custody angle of having vaults and multi-signatures where nobody can take your money away in a way you don't intend. So for Bitcoin, there are a couple of things to work on here. You know, non-custodial, all the things, anything that has sort of a custodial aspect today, try and minimize the number of parties that could unilaterally act to take away your funds. Um, helping people self-host infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that people have to do and it's complicated to set up. Like setting up a lightning node is, you know, not the easiest thing to do. And so some people have sort of veered more towards hosted services where somebody else is taking on the operational complexity. But one way you can make impact would be to say, well, here's an easy way to set this up and here's a better way for managing this so that you, anybody could run it anywhere in the world without having to trust somebody else to operate it for them. Uh, and better wallets in general just for managing your assets and, and stuff like that. So. The next sort of bucket uh, in this is um, decentralization. So decentralization is sort of this, uh, you know, consistency, availability, partition proofness of it without a centralized actor. And that's something that, um, you know, if you recognize the, the critical words there, is kind of like we know that we can't really do, but we're going to make a good effort at it anyways. Um, and so for Bitcoin, there's a lot of things that you could work on. Um, you could work on mining pools, you could work on consensus research, node security and resource usage, and even more to make sure that the network is actually composed of a, of a wide variety of different uh, actors. And this is sort of where the system drives a lot of its value, is that there's no one party who can say, we're going to append all the rules and change how it works. It's something that is accountable to a much wider set of people. 
And so lastly, uh, you know, scaling is just really, really critical because the ultimate technology that we have today for self-sovereignty, does anybody have any cool guesses of what the best self-sovereignty technology is? Okay, no, it's actually super yachts, right? Think about it, if you have a super yacht, you can literally have a floating city that's under your complete control, and like people actually have these things, right? It's kind of like crazy to think about, but like you could, if you can afford a super yacht, like no matter what you wanna do, like you can just do it. But like we all know that like the number of people in the world who could have a super yacht is like probably like at most like a thousand or something like that. You're not gonna have like everybody sailing around in a super yacht. It's just not like the economics of it don't really work out, right? So. That means that super yachts, even though they represent this phenomenal like self-sovereignty thing where you could make your own floating nation, it's not really like a great solution for everybody to benefit from that. And if you can't build a solution that everybody can benefit from, you don't actually build to a world that provides people more liberty. You sort of provide more liberty to the people who already have the most liberty. And while you know I'm not really like a you know wealth uh, you know inequality you know nut job where I'm going to be saying well we've got to make everybody equal. Uh, what I would say is that it matters a lot if there's people who do not have the optionality in their life to decide what makes them happy. Uh, and that's sort of where the, the biggest impact I feel is. And if Bitcoin becomes sort of the economic equivalent of the super yacht, for me, I feel like it's irrelevant. I don't really care to produce a tool that is serving as the you know, financial equivalent of the super yacht. I want the, you know, the, the dinghy that's the life raft for everyone. So, there are things that you can work on in that regard, you know, layer twos, payment pools, lightning, block size increases, just kidding. Uh, new crypto, zero knowledge rollups, there's a lot of things you could do that would help more people have a fully self-sovereign, private, um, uh, decentralized way of maintaining their own value and money. So uh, what, what time am I breaking at on this, by the way? Five minutes, okay. So. I, I put a slide in here, I talked about it a little bit in the last panel, so I'm not gonna go too in depth. This whole BIP 119 thing, I don't know, like, there's a lot of disagreement. I'm not an attacker, it's messy work. It is the work, like this is, you know, these consensus processes is a part of the decentralization. You have to convince a very broad set of people, you have to make these arguments in public, not in closed boardrooms. Um, I hope you can see I'm not an attacker, uh, and all I was trying to do was propose something that would help with these four categories of things that I thought were really critical to work on. And I'm not giving up working on liberty. This is a part of a process to try to bring uh, applications that help people navigate these really tricky waters. So the overall point here is uh, you really can't miss if you work on increasing people's liberty. Uh, it, it's a really uh, noble goal to focus on. Um, and over the course of your life, like, you know, everybody you know, here, you're probably gonna be able to make enough money to be you know, personally happy and secure. Um, but when you look out on, you know, what is the world that you're participating in, one of these questions you're going to ask yourself is, is this a world where people have as much, uh, you know, privilege a, a, as you had, and would it be a better world if people had access to the type of opportunities and ability to, you know, choose for themselves what would make them happy? And I think that that is a better world to move towards, and so if you want to work on, you know, cryptocurrency and you want to be in it in the long run, you just have to always keep centered on increasing people's individual liberties. Um, if you think Bitcoin sucks, like don't work on it. Um, I, I'm not here to tell you that Bitcoin is like the only way to do this. There's a lot of other really great technologies uh, and not just in cryptocurrency that can really help people uh, with this, you know, in global internet access. Not everybody actually has access to the internet and you can even begin to think about having access to Bitcoin if you don't have access to the internet. So also an example of something that's a, a big liberty increasing technology. Imagine you could learn about anything from anywhere. That's something that we still haven't realized in the internet you know, is decades and decades in. Um, but we're getting closer and working on getting closer also very important. But wherever you go, build liberty. So what am I doing? Well, like, you know, I'm working on DAOs and like, there's a ton of hype in DAOs. So if you, you know, disapprove, like, I get that. Um, my thesis is basically that DAOs are a liberty technology because they help groups coordinate sharing resources to secure a mutually beneficial outcome. And I don't think that those are outcomes that people can drive unless they have some sort of coordination mechanism. And so what I'm hoping to do personally is bring coordination tools for groups of people to Bitcoin where they can securely and, you know, with, uh, you know, sort of some abilities to, to you know, audit and uh, not get completely rugged, 
participate in an actual economy. That's sort of why I put, picked this as an important thing for Bitcoin. I think that Bitcoin suffers if people can't actually use it in practice um, in, a, in a shared context. So that's why I'm you know, personally focusing on DAOs. Um, and so if you're you know, interested in that in particular, like you know, there's my pitch, like you know, I'm mainly working on Liberty. I think there's a concrete product I can bring to market around DAOs that will help people have a lot more self-sovereign, private, scalable, um, and decentralized control over their you know, shared endeavors. So that's my view, but ultimately like, I want to work and help with anybody who's trying to improve the you know, status of individual liberties in the world, and that, that's what I would encourage anybody here to just double down into. Don't be afraid of that. So thank you very much. I'm for a, a question or two. Oh, um, yeah, so basically uh, with this uh, DAO incubator program that I'm uh, sort of setting up, um, I don't know if we can, if I can get this back up, but um, essentially, you know, Bitcoin doesn't have a lot of the tools for doing DAOs like Ethereum has, but it does have the best money. And so part of my thesis is that uh, people are gonna wanna do these things uh, on Bitcoin. Um, we don't have any of the tools ready right now, and so I'm sort of launching an alpha program to uh, find some of the uh, uh, people who might be interested in building those things um, and do some sort of tight feedback loops with a couple of them and then bring that out to more organizations or people who want to build things. So a simple example of a DAO that I like to give is uh, imagine that you and uh, 10 friends want to have a standing you know, drinks out on Thursday evening and you all put you know, 1,000 bucks in at the beginning of the year and now you've got something that anytime six out of 10 of you are together, you're able to pay for drinks for the group and you benefit by having the community of like, you know, your, your Thursday happy hour uh, be a fixed thing. But there's some mechanism maybe for people to quit out of that if, um, you know, if they're no longer a part of the social club. And so those types of things might require, um, that's a simple example of something you can imagine exactly how it works today, um, where building out more things like that for Bitcoin will have Bitcoin um, be the sort of reserve asset for a number of social things people coordinate. You can imagine how that concept maps onto other things like managing real estate or properties communally, for example. Uh, maybe time for one more, or are we set? One more? All right. <laughs> uh, good question. Uh, not a plant. Um, you can go to uh, utxos.org slash signals. Um, the you know, controversy around there is like, is this something that is trying to be pushed out to the network like today? It's something that the network could decide to adopt. And if you're interested, there's utxos.org slash signals. You can read about you know, um, who supports it and then also like what the thing is actually that people are you know, caring about or trying to support. Um, and uh, you know, other than that, it's sort of, I think this narrative that Andrew and I were talking about earlier, which is like, does Bitcoin have the right key ingredients right now to become the best cash? And I think that both Andrew and I can't speak for him directly, but like would agree that we probably need a couple more ingredients to actually become that liberty money that we want it to be. And so we should, we should work towards adding those. And if BIP 119 is a good thing for that, then let's do it. If it's not, then let's double down on our research efforts to get something that's going to deliver. So uh, I'll leave you guys there. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll be around for any other questions. <laughs> <laughs>